angsting about his crushed Kira and how he's totally <laughs> on the other side. And how he's going to totally shoot him if he can't convince him to not be on the Earth side. So the stage is set. The coordinator group that has stolen the Gundams is cornered the Archangel and trapped them. They are sending all four of the stolen Gundams after them. Mulaflaga is sneaking ahead to try and take out the battleship ahead of them. And Kira Yamato has to defend the ship four on one. I like those odds. He did reprogram an entire operating system while also fending off a Jin. Jin. So did Athrin, Yeah, but though. it was only one. Did Athrin actually reprogram the operating system? They all did. I thought uh, Raul was like, man, these operating systems are crap. Glad we don't have to work with those They much reprogrammed longer. them to the extent that they could get just walk away. But I guess Kira went the whole hog and reprogrammed the whole thing for combat. How did they ship those things with such terrible... Like, it's not that hard they, to write an operating system. They didn't ship them. That's where they were produced. Oh, okay. That's true. So that brings us to episode five, Phase Shift Down. If you want to watch along with us, and Gundam Seed is good, so I recommend you do. So we don't get the big explanation I just gave you, or a sort of informed flashback. We just get a recap of the last episode and all the tension. And basically, the Archangel is trying to run away from all the Zaf ships as the Zaf ships are cornering them because Rao countered Moo's plan because that's the thing they do. All is um, making it sound like there's more than two ships. Okay, yeah, I guess there are two ships. Yeah, we got a two-on-one situation for battleship combat here. Also, there's a space station in the distance. Yeah, I forgot to mention the Archangel are trying to make their way to an allied space station, and they've just been cut off. So they have to get through one battleship. That should be easy, right? Or die trying. I'm sure that's what happens. I'm sure they all Definitely. die, and then Atherton becomes the protagonist. Jeremy, you're not supposed to spoil it. I mean, he's got protagonists written all over him, right? I didn't notice that the first time I watched. It's so obvious that he's supposed to be a main focal character. I don't know how I didn't, because I was young and stupid, and saw him as the Shar rival, but... <laughs> I mean, I feel like he's almost a foil to Kira at this point. Yeah, exactly. I said earlier, he's the deuteragonist. He is just as important as Kira. He actually is kind of a foil... Now that I think about it. Yeah, he's on the other I, side. He's a little more willing to be in the war. We'll get to that later. Well, I wasn't going to go that far into it, but like, he's obviously more commanding than Kira. He's fighting by his own Oh, yeah. This is major spoiler. But in the last episode, Atherin grabs the girl he likes and plants one raid on her, whereas the girl Kira likes is begging him with her eyes to do something, and he kind of awkwardly waves and uh, moves <laughs> off. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that. That's true. <laughs> Atherin is clearly the more active participant. Yeah. Well, Kira's kind of a pushover. Kind like, we've of? We've already seen that. Yeah, he's a bamf in combat, but... He'll do what needs done. But very only awkward when needs social situations. So the episode begins with the three stolen Gundams we haven't seen yet, activating their face ship armor and heading for the Archangel. Whereas the Archangel is like, oh no, it's those three mobile suits. I love the animation for the face shift turning on, too. Yeah, it's really well done. Speaking of animation, you were talking about the character faces. I really notice it with Captain Romius. She has all sorts of expressions. I was like, couldn't you have spent like five more <laughs> minutes with this? The Archangel's preparing for battle. So you got cannons deploying, missile tubes opening up. I really like just the... You can watching see the artillery all, deploy. Yeah, watching all the equipment and you just get a feel of just how heavily armored this battleship is. Or how heavily armed this thing is. He never really got that with the white base, I felt. Yeah, I'm more into when they're like, prepare to fire cannons, fire cannons. But... Getting the whole setup of deploying the long cannons, opening the missile tubes is pretty cool. Well, and they don't spend too much time on it. It's like while they're doing other things, you just get that shot in the background with the text overlay. It's like a total of five seconds. So Atherin approaches Kira and the Aegis, and the two of them kind of freak out at each other. That mobile suit, Atherin? <laughs> I've talked about how the dub is inconsistent. This is a really poorly dubbed episode, except Kira and Atherin who they do a really good job of getting around the really awkward Japanese thing where the Japanese use a lot of incomplete sentences. They write around that really well, but all the other characters are just <laughs> not very well dubbed this episode. So the Archangel fires an opening missile salvo, and like I just said, I like when people are saying to load missile tubes and fire cannons, and we get a nice bit of dialogue about that. Do well, you ever find out the difference between our sledgehammers and Corinthos missiles? No, that's If you flavor. look at the expanded universe fiction, yes. Okay. There are apparently two different missile tubes on the Archangel, the there, Corinthos and Sledgehammers. There are also Hell Darts and Wombats. I always thought the Hell Darts were the, like the anti-missile defensive missiles, like the uh, A cannons, but that's not even true. <laughs> they have actual like point defense guns. So Atherin and Kira grab their beam sabers. The Aegis actually has a pretty cool thing where its limbs just have beam sabers built in. It is actually kind of neat. 
And Athrun tries to convince Kira to lay down his arms and join Zaft. To say, we're not enemies, we're both coordinators. Meanwhile, Izak, who is the silver-haired guy who's got the duel, is like, I'm going to go help Athrun. You two guys fight the Archangel. And Diarca is a little miffed about that. But Nicola's like, yeah, okay. Whatevs. Every time the Archangel enters combat, and this is the first time we see it, and it, it just reinforces just how heavily armed the thing is. It's just spraying gunfire everywhere. <laughs> it really is. There's four suits. We're just going to fill the entire spaceways with gunfire for no adequate reason. The Archangel is my favorite fictional battleship, in part because of that. The only thing I don't like about it is it doesn't have many guns on the bottom side, which seems kind of like a tactical flaw. But that'll come up later this episode. So Kira and Atherin continue their discussion about whether or not he should go join Zaft. He tells Atherin, hey, I'm not with the Earth Forces, but I have friends on this ship. Which I have really shocks them. Atherin. He's like, you have friends? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Since when do you have friends? So he's like, turn about his flair play, Atherin. You said you hated war, so why did you join Zaft? And Atherin is clearly a little bit pained to talk about it. And he's like, hey, it's the natural's fault. They built those dumb weapons, so we had to destroy Heliopolis. Both of them clearly have important reasons to be on the side of war. Unlike other Gundam series where often one of the factions is just clearly evil, Kira is joining the Earth forces for noble reasons, and Atherin is also saying he has noble reasons. We'll find out what they are a little bit later. It's implied that he has noble reasons, if nothing else, especially... It's clearly strongly set up that he's the counterpoint to Kira, so he has to have some motivation we can agree with. Because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if he's just a massive douchebag. So while they're having their conversation, Kira gets 2v1, is, is abruptly 2v1 in the middle also, of this conversation. Is it, who, who's helping them? Isaac shows up in the duel. Right. Isn't the point of clearance? The duel is basically the original Gundam remodel, right? Very similar. In canon, it's the first of the seed Gundams to be built. It has basically the same armaments as the Gundam. It doesn't have the fancy things like the javelin or the hammer. And it has an underslung grenade launcher on the beam rifle. That seems useful. Also, can you imagine how great it would be if you just shouted, Ezak Hammer! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I want that so bad now. <laughs> the proximity detector that they show you doesn't seem like it'd be a particularly useful piece of equipment in space because it's not a three-dimensional thing. Yeah. So Atherin and Kira are kind of circling each other, but not really fighting. When the duel shows up and starts shooting, Kira has to start defend maneuvering, himself. though he mostly does defend himself. And the Archangel uses his anti-beam depth charges for the first time, which I love because they're basically spreading Minovsky particles to combat density. That's their equivalent phrase. And I love <laughs> Misum spreading Minovsky particles to combat density. My question is always with the Archangel, just how much ammunition do they carry? Because they fire off probably a couple hundred thousand rounds in each fight. A lot of them don't look like they're physical rounds, though, so... Their Heldarts, Sledgehammers, and Corinthos most certainly are physical rounds. Well, you know, there's a reason they didn't have a huge crew on this ship. It's because <laughs> half its cargo is missiles. Yeah, all the so missiles are obviously physical. The Valiants, which are the side cannons, which are the main weapon it uses in this fight, I've always assumed they were railguns, but I was looking at the armament specs to prepare for this episode, and it's kind of unclear whether or not those are solid fire or not to me. They look, Although, they're animated as though they're beam weapons. But, but they could all railguns in Gundam are kind of animated yeah, e that way. They could yeah. easily be railguns. Of course, with, with rail weaponry, all you really need is a small piece of metal. Yeah, super dense, or like a super dense chunk of nickel iron, and that's usually what's going to do a crap load of damage. But have you guys actually seen a railgun fire, like, off of a naval vessel? Because they don't look anything like this. It, it looks just like a piece of metal just flying out of a tube. No, but so. Gauss rifles are incredibly effective weapons in Battletech. Yeah. The moral of the story, though, is it doesn't actually have a fancy firing animation. It looks really boring. And one of the things the remake of Gundam Seed, or I should say the reanimation, tried to do was distinctly animate shell-firing weapons more. The Freedom's railguns often look more like railguns. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know the Freedom had railguns. The hip guns are supposed to be railguns. Really? I yeah. thought they were just beam weapons. In the original, they're animated the same way as the... They're yellow. That's how you can tell. But oh, they do totally. look like continuous streams. Because, well, the original one, they were animated like the big guns. Yeah. The, the really... What are they called? Lohengrin. Yeah. Lohengrin is a beam weapon, but it's pink. So, the Ark is shooting at the Archangel, but we see its laminate armor in action. I don't know if the laminate armor has ever gone over in the series, but again, in the AU, it talks about how the Archangel's armor is designed to spread heat all over the ship, so if it's hit by beam weapons, it can easily negate the damage. We are actually developing modern ceramic armor to ablate heat from lasers for that same purpose right now. So, as Izak continues his assault, 
Kira decides to get serious, and we get a very Star Wars-esque targeting computer, although it also looks pretty Gundam, in front of Kira's face as he starts shooting back. Kira, turn off your targeting computer. Diarca agrees with Zack and says the Archangel is super well-armed, so they decide to flank it, and the Blitz goes below, which, as I said, it doesn't have many guns below, just a couple of close-in machine guns. So Maru does one of my favorite things, where she gives exacting orders about how to turn, where to aim the guns. I love it, and the Archangel does a barrel roll <laughs> to shoot the guns at the ship below. And we see Flay inside. The living quarters now don't have artificial gravity, and she's screaming because the ship is rolling on its side. Well, that makes sense. Although, why they finally deploy the other guns to turn, I'm not entirely certain why they didn't do that to begin with. Because we see another gun pop out of the, like, cruising housing yeah. and rotate to open fire. Why that thing wasn't already doing so is beyond me. Maybe it has a bad angle for the approach. Well, it would have had a bad angle anyway. It looks like it's a main gun, so it's probably not really well suited you mean to one, shooting at You mean uh, one of the ones suits? in the top right corner? Yeah. Like those, those are the Godfreets. They're beam guns. They were extensively used the last time the Archangel fought in the colony. So I'm not sure if we're supposed to assume that the Valiants that are broadside are more powerful or what. Actually, they're not really broadside because the Archangel's front is its broadside. But it is because it's a naval vessel and doesn't need it, or it's a space vessel and doesn't need a broadside. So well, the broadside would still be fairly effective. Come to think of it, why isn't it just a sphere? Why aren't all spaceships just spheres? In theory, if you wanted to land on the planet, it would be much more difficult than a sphere. There's actually a book series that I have read that explains it. Why would you ever want to land on a planet? Space all their, is cool. All their spaceships in that one are actually long, like sausages, but they explain that s- exploration vessels are spheres. Oh, well, see, that makes sense. It, that solves my really concerns. Weird. But in this case, I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense because, number one, the Archangel looks a lot cooler than a sphere. It that may is not true. Be le- it may be less effective, but it looks a lot cooler. I mean, rule of cool is a thing. Also, we don't know how big the Lohengrins have to be. It might be awkward to make them a sphere. That is true, because it might cut into living quarters or something if they had to, like, retract into there. Mm-hmm. Although, like I said, those Gottfrieds might just not be extensively effective against mobile suits. They might be anti-battleship cannons. So if they try not to fire them against mobile suits because... That's true. I'm actually Slow targeting th- or something. I'm kind of wondering what like the energy output of the Archangel is, because it has all these beam weapons. A couple like, dozen cities <laughs> would what's, be my guess. What's its power source? What does it run on? Huh, I don't know. Because, kind of spoiler, it can't be nuclear. Okay, why not? That'll be explained later. Okay. But nuclear power is kind of a no-go huh. in this series, which is why the mobile suits are battery-powered, which is going to be a problem. Huh. Shortly. An ass load of diesel engines. <laughs> they drew power directly from Heliopolis in, I want to say, the first or second episode. So theoretically, it can be inductively charged. Yeah. Diesel electric, I'm calling it now. <laughs> so we cut over to the Versalius, which is the ship Raul Crusade is on in front of them. They see that the Archangel is headed towards them. They don't see Moos Mobius Zero, and they assume that it's still damaged. Which kind of is in contrast to last episode, where Rao was super smart about everything. To be fair, it's a reasonable assumption to think that it's still damaged. I don't fault him for that. It is, it was but pretty heavily battle damage, and they managed to exactly. get it working within like two or three days. That's Actually, impressive. Actually, a couple hours now that I think about it. It makes a lot of sense to me. It's just that, in contrast to the previous episode, where Rao nearly had psychic powers regarding the Archangel's plan. <laughs> okay, that's fair. It seems a little odd, but it's not crazy. To be uh, fair, there were only two options he had to choose from in the previous episode is, are they going to the moon or are they going to this base? Yeah. So There are only two options here. Is it fixed or not? <laughs> so he chose wrong. Last time he flipped a coin in his head, this time he flipped a coin in his head. Yeah. So we cut back to Kira fighting Izak in the duel. He's firing his beam rifle very wildly. He's not hitting. And we see the power indicator on this mobile suit slowly sliding down. Izak makes fun of him. He, clearly he's more trained. And he goes for the beam saber and tries to fight him melee. Which would conserve power. Which Kira deftly blocks with a shield. I'm surprised how use like, in old Gundam, that would have just sliced right through the shield. Yeah, the so. shields are super useful against beams in Gundam Seed. It's kind of, not quite a running joke, but it is a thing. So then we cut to Mu, who is also at a very Star Wars thing. He's like, not quite yet. He's not actually going through a trench, but on his computer, he has like a laser <laughs> trench coming Stay out. on target. Stay on target. Rao wants to fire the Versalius's main guns at the Archangel. Captain Addis is a little bit against it because he doesn't want any friendly fire, but Rao's and like, I was like I, they won't be that clumsy to get hit by our weapons. He, no fool would fall the, the friendly fire. The captain's a lot smarter he, than that. Like, <laughs> just firing your main guns into a brawl with your guys there is... Seems is like a really, bad idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Archangel's okay because it's only got one target that it could possibly hit. To be fair, the mobile and suits are really small targets. 
Cure's actually not close to the Archangel, so they can just blind fire. But he could also drop on top of it right away and be okay to not be hit by his own guys. But that far away, being shot at, you fire your own guns in there, somebody makes one wrong juke, they're total. And Rao's counter-argument is the Archangel is going to be shooting us. We need suppressive fire, basically. That is true. And that is actually even a good argument for it. We need to shoot it because our mobile suits are way closer to it. So we need to distract it so it doesn't shoot them. So you guys have played Battlefront. Zach hates it. One of my least favorite things is when you're shot down by friendly fire by the AA cannons on your own ship. It's the worst. So Kira's trying to get back to the Archangel to defend it, but Izak keeps cutting him off, and he continues to lose power as he misses with his beam rifle. These mobile suit duels look pretty damn good, too. One of the reasons I think Seed is so good is that the animation is just really on another level from previous Gundam series. This, uh, what's her name? Be- Be- Badgerol? Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Badgerol... We have seen now four times, four times she has turned, making that exact same, like, they use this frame over and over. Yeah, there's also another time, there's like a rear shot of the Archangel shooting a bunch of missiles and blasts behind it that they use two or three times. <laughs> That's her battle face. But we've seen this exact same scene like four times already this I, episode. I don't quite understand how they have their combat center set up because she's just sitting in the middle and there don't seem to be any screens in front of her. So yeah, she's a, spewing orders, but she doesn't look like she actually knows what's going on. There's obviously a monitor in front of her. I mean, you can see her turning away from it earlier. I don't think we ever actually see a monitor in front of her. My problem thing. is there's all those monitors behind where all the crew sits, and no one's looking at no, them. No, there's another so, crew. There's crewmen in the chairs okay. behind him. She's sitting in the middle, and then the four crewmen that are actually part of the battle center. Okay. The, the BDC would be, and there are actually on the sides. I don't think it's uncommon for one person to be in the center being fed information and just trying to Being like sub-captain. But you would think there'd be a display that would tell you, not everything, but at least it would give you a sense of what's going on. Like the science sensor in... (laughs) Yeah, but the captain doesn't get that in Artemis. Not technically. Full disclosure, I always imagine I'm on the Archangel when I'm captaining Artemis. (laughs) And I say nuke, but I'm thinking low and grim. (laughs) <laughs> you know, next time we play Artemis, you can tell me to launch the low and grins, and I will. Okay. So, <laughs> so Badrill is concerned because the Nazca class in front of them is going to fire, and she wants to fire the low and grin. The captain doesn't want to because she's afraid of hitting Moo, and that would ruin the plan. But Badrill has the same argument as Laura Crusade, where it's, we need to shoot them or we will get shot by them. And Diarca has gone and is joining Izak and Atherin and trying to attack the strike, and Nickel shows up to help them too, and it's now four on one. So Rao gets not quite a new type flash, but a similar effect, and suddenly he realizes, oh crap, uh, Moo is here, and he starts giving, <laughs> again, sweet, roll the deck, maximum thrust orders. But they're too late, and Moo slips in, and somehow with his tiny gun barrels, gets a direct hit on the engines, and seriously injures the Versalius. Oh, he also those... employs the main cannon. Like, he just unloads a hell storm of fire onto really this I really like these funnels, too. Oh, I forgot about his cool... Like, tow rope. Apparently the Mobius is equipped with a tow missile. Yeah, going full speed, he shoots basically like a snowspeeder harpoon at the (laughs) ship. So to use his momentum to turn around using it, and then just slingshots the other way. It is really cool, and I just forgot that it was on there. Yeah, that would actually be an effective thing to outfit most of your fighters with when assaulting capital ships in like actual space combat. Yeah, in space combat, because you can use it to spin quickly through... Any the, close range AA fire? The downside is, can you imagine the G force on that? Yeah, I was thinking that, like, ugh, it sucks to be Moo in there. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it would be very brief, and we already have planes that would pull out of, at, like, 9G. I mean, That's I can't true. imagine that thing being much more than 9G or something like that. I don't know. I might but have to do some math to support this. It would this. depend on how, like, what kind of, like, inertial compensators or something like that they would put in those fighters. That is true. He might have, like, something in his chamber that helps with that. Yeah, like, in Star Wars, they're inertial damp. There could be something like that which would compensate that. Fun fact, in an unnamed prototype plane that I'm not allowed to give the name of because it's classified, but everything about the plane is not classified, we're actually now filling it with a kind of salt, like an oil solution to help compensate for gravity changes inside of the chamber of the cockpit. So the pilot is basically wearing a dive suit inside of the plane because the G-forces on it are so high he needs the water to help him slosh around. Interesting. And not rupture his organs. (laughs) So Moo gets in stealthily, shoots off, and then gets away before anyone can retaliate, which leads to like, damn you, Moo! Number five sodium wall. What exactly is that? No idea. They seal off bulkheads, though. Know what that means. Rao is furious. Tried to order them to shoot it down. Apparently, they didn't have the ability to 
hit it on its way out, but he was going pretty He fast. also went out, I think, around their engines. They didn't well, have he, guns he facing back, that way. He hooked back around on the front of them. Okay. But I think at that point, he would have been going so fast that by the time you even get fire back at him, it's not going to do anything. It's whether they should have found him on the way in and they yeah. were too slow. Though I think it is just they're really lax. They think they have everything figured out. And well, they, they were don't. winning. Yeah, yep. that's true. Pretty significantly. And like I said earlier, they just assumed that it was inoperable and assumed incorrectly, which is the worst thing to do in a battle situation. So they suffered immense damage, and Le Creuset has given orders to pull retreat, back. Retreat, basically, and let the other craft know. Yeah, so now they no longer have a ship blocking their way. With the damage in the engines, the Archangel could just steamroll it at this point. And the Archangel is ready to fire its low end grin, which are its main cannons, right at it. Then we get the splash. Hey, it's me, Jeremy. Thank you again for listening to our podcast, It's a Gundam, Episode 5, Phase Shift Down, the first action-heavy episode. I really like this one, but you don't care about that. Maybe you do, however, care about winning some fabulous prizes. We have a Freedom Gundam Master Grade 2.0 model kit, a copy of Gundam The OAth MS Team on Blu-ray, and a copy of Gundam The OAth MS Team on DVD, all of which we are giving away. All you have to do is email us at Gundam at lasttimeonvideogames.com or tweet with the hashtag Gundam podcast. Either way, you will be entered, and if you do both, you will be entered twice. On August the 15th, we are going to do a random drawing. Whoever we pick out first gets their pick, whichever prize they want. Whoever we pick out second can choose between the other two, and whoever we pick third will get whatever is left. So email us, tell us what you think of the podcast, or send us a tweet, or send us a tweet at LTOV Gundam. Again, that's tweet us at LTOV Gundam, or email us at Gundam at lasttimeonvideogames.com. Next episode will not be out until Monday, so I can stop recording these, and hopefully by then we will be on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. No one calls it that, though. We are on Google Play if you want to see us there, or you can always check our website, lastpodcasts.com. That's where you can see our mobile suit ranking, as well as get all our episodes. So yeah, I'll let you guys get back to it. Like I said, it's a really good episode, so hope you're enjoying. Bye. And then we get the Archangel saying, hey, Moo did it. Yeah. Yay! Let's shoot it with our giant cannons. Tell Moo to get out of the way. So, you know, we get some nice little techno babble about how the low grids work. There's something about regulating muzzle choke. Positron bank, breath chamber at maximum. <laughs> Muzzle choke potential has stabilized opening launchers. I like techno babble. <laughs> that is such techno. Man, Catherine's like having a panic attack. That's Catherine. Kira. Yeah, I know. Well, it is four on one. So the Versailles is like, hey, we were hit. Get out of here, guys. Isaac is like, why would we do that? It's four on one. We're totally going to win. Oh, shit. Their giant lasers are firing. <laughs> oh, man. That's such a cool effect. <laughs> How do they miss? They have enough engine power that Rao starts to dodge. It kind of goes by. It does that anime thing where there's not a direct hit, but there's an explosion nearby, so presumably they hit with some of it. And the Versailles is further injured. And Captain Ramis is like, okay, tell Kira to return. We will go full speed and get to the base behind them. And they have retreat flares. That's actually a really handy thing to use instead of trying to get through any kind of jamming that might have been there. Yeah. Because that is a very, very, very bright flash that any pilot would be able to see. So despite orders to retreat, Izak is very active and like, hey, we're not going to let him get away and tries to cut Kira off. <laughs> Who's spinning wildly. It's a good trick. Better than listening lazily to the left. We get a notification from Maru that they can't actually back the strike up because they can't. They were kidding it's him. It's too close. Yeah. And the flog is on the way back. They're like, hey, trouble. And he's like, what? He can't return? That fool! <laughs> I mean, at the outset, it sounds like really bad, but then again, it makes perfect sense. He got too far away from the ship to return. Now we see Kira continuing to fire wildly, and suddenly the gun starts to fizzle, and he's out of power. Again, we get that cool phase shift armor effect, but it's turning off instead of on. And that's the title of the episode, Phase Shift Down. Someone's going to say it super awkwardly in the English dub, probably awkwardly in the original too, but I don't <laughs> speak Japanese well enough to know. So Isaac's about to kill Kira, where an Atherin transforms the Aegis into its weird claw mode and just grabs him. <laughs> okay, yoink, we're going. Time to we're retreat, taking, like, ordered. I'm taking this, and I'm <laughs> going home. That's actually... Why does it have that mode, though? Uh, that's both... I don't like the Aegis. I, I've kind of come around on it, but that thing, I was like, 
why this? This isn't the Wave Rider mode. Why do you transform into this? They refer to it as transforming into a mobile armor, which doesn't make any sense. And then we get this long, like, constantly panning over shot of Kira in his cockpit while Athrun's talking to him. Honestly, and it's kind of made me nauseous. <laughs> yeah, because it's just constantly passing over. It doesn't seem to have any real purpose or make any sense. And well, Izak is pissed they're not killing him. Well, which I think is weird Diarca because... is too, but Diarca doesn't have a personality without Izak. <laughs> To be fair, like, why wouldn't you want to capture the prototype mobile suit? Why bother making a new one? Tyler, I'm going to give you a little spoiler here. Isaac is a dick. Oh, okay. Well, I kind of got that. He's the silver-haired guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, he's a dick. <laughs> That's been established. Little kid guy who I thought was a girl, Nickel. not a dick. Nickel. They're foils. Kind of. <laughs> the squad is two dicks, two not dicks. Yeah. Moo is like, hey, Archangel, get ready to launch the launcher striker. They have the... What the they're like messages look like text messages I know, from I some love kind that. of uh, <laughs> like a video game of this thing where like someone would well, pop like on the screen. Like a hack game, actually. Well, I was thinking of like some kind of virtual novel or something like that where you get like the animation person, the, the actual person speaking, and then underneath it has what they're saying. And they appear on screen and then that comes up on screen. It seems like a lot of wasted resources. Also, they do that thing where they have an English message, but since it's Japanese, you're not supposed to read it perfectly and it's not quite accurate. I just assumed that they were, like, leaving out words because time is sensitive. That makes so. sense. Atherin and Kira now have time for a talk. Atherin's like, hey, I'm taking you to the ship. Kira's like, no, I won't join Zaf! Exclamation point. <laughs> Atherin's like, hey, if you don't, I'll have to kill you. And I already lost my mom during the Bloody Valentine tragedy. Which, as I alluded to earlier, is Atherin's motivation for joining the army. And it makes him a little more sympathetic. He was already kind of sympathetic, but this makes it really clear. No, clearly he doesn't want to kill his love interest. But then as they're doing that, Moo to the rescue and just does all sorts of crazy Moo maneuvers. Okay, so here's where the phase shift armor gets kind of inconsistent, which is one of the few problems with this episode. It all works because drama, but Moo has shell-firing weapons. Here's one of the places where they're clearly animated that way, but he's able to shoot the Aegis enough that it has to drop the strike. Well, isn't the main gun on that thing not a shell-firing gun? I'm yeah, the, pretty sure they're all shell-firing, but I'm not. I the main be gun looks like a beam weapon, but the... It, well, technically, so do the funnels. The like, funnels they look, all look like, like they should be beam, me, beam but, weapons, but... Moo hits the Aegis. Atherin has to let him go. Izak is even more pissed because they didn't even capture it right. And again, Moo manages just to sneak in without anyone seeing him or being aware of him showing up. But, Although I suppose the message was not, a mobile armor screwed us up. It was just, we got hit. The shells are exploding, so it's entirely possible, and the Aegis isn't damaged. So it's not that the thing isn't taking damage, or that the guns are doing damage to it. It's the HE rounds are exploding, and it's forcing him to let go. Or maybe it just surprised Athrun so much <laughs> that he clicked the button on accident. Oh, so it's like Minecraft, and hit Q and went in the third-person mode, <laughs> threw his diamond pickaxe into the lava, and went third-person because he saw a creeper. It just looks like the explosions that are coming in from it and these guys haven't been at the helms of these things for very long. That's true. I could totally buy the pilot panicking, even though you don't actually see him really panic, but think, don't really oh God, see I'm under fire. don't anything in response to being under fire. Well, I mean, so. he's under fire. He's been hit. Drop it and bail before you get knocked out without realizing the armor this thing's equipped with. This shouldn't do anything. Kira now escapes, and he tries to get back to the Archangel so they can launch him the launcher striker. Because as was previously established, the weapon and power packs are integrated, so that will restore his power and give him a giant gun. The launcher striker is the one that he wasted Heliopolis with. Yes, it's really good at blowing off mobile suit arms. <laughs> well, that's because if it was things. a direct hit, that character would have to be written out of the show, so... Yeah, Izak again chases after him, uh, with the Arca's health this time. In the buster? Yes. The Ark has got the buster. Again, we get that shot I was talking about that's just <laughs> rear-firing Archangel shot. I can see why they want to reuse that, though, because it's actually a pretty good shot. Yeah, I'm not being critical of it. I wouldn't have noticed if I didn't watch this episode five times for this podcast. <laughs> Their mechanic is not happy about launching the power pack. Yeah, because it's a stupid idea. <laughs> but it is the idea they need to do because it's appropriately dramatic, and clearly they're in a bad situation. So they match their speed to the strikes so that the armor go actually i don't see why they need to do that they could just launch it at variable rates but eh. moo continues fighting atherin and nickel and the blitz and the aegis basically and just distracting them not really returning fire at all he's mostly just avoiding shots at this point so the duel arrives it wants to cut off the strike it locks on the strike is in position to accept the launcher strike catapult release 
We see the gear launch out into space wildly, which seems like a terrible idea. Also, Kira just leaves the gear he's currently wearing. He just detaches it. How do they pick that up later? Yeah, that's actually what I'm wondering. I wonder <laughs> if that comes up in the next episode. I don't remember it doing so. They are near the base, so presumably they could send someone out, but... He launched it forward, so it's entirely possible that as the Archangel moved in, they locked a beacon onto it or something like that and retrieved it off screen. Yeah, it's definitely possible. It's just or weird Kira when... Or picked it up on their way by. I, I have no idea. It's just weird when we have consistencies like the sword strike not having its boomerang after it threw it, but it's super reasonable that they might have more than one of those to supply it with, whereas I don't think they have multiple ale strikers. Right. Considering it's a prototype. So Isaac has a nice, very Star Wars-esque locking on segment with Kira, who's like, oh, no, he locked on, and he fires that RPG I talked about earlier. The uh, under beam grenade. rifle. Even though he could just fire the beam and... Yeah, that but grenades not... are dramatic. Also, the beam would not likely destroy the strike. It would damage it, but it, it likely wouldn't take it down in one shot. So I... there's a giant explosion. The dust is settling. Isaac is like, did I get it? It's very shonen anime. And of course, out of the dust comes the launcher striker, fully colored with the well, he uh, entered... armor on. He uh, enters after... the fight with just blasting Isaac's arm off. Yeah, again, this is the second <laughs> arm the launcher strike has claimed with its giant laser. It it's got mis- Rouse first. <laughs> it's miscalibrated. <laughs> when Kira messed with the operating system, he didn't take into account the launcher striker's big-ass cannon because he was working with the Vulcans. It's so far off to the side, it always hits arms. <laughs> so Kira comes out of the explosion, beam spamming just like he did with the AL striker, but now with a giant beam rifle. This is plenty of suppressing fire. Isaac can barely get away and only with help from the buster which is being shot at by Moo. Atherin gives a retreat order, since they were supposed to anyway. And Nickel's like, yeah, we have to retreat, or we're going to run out of power, and then we'll all be super screwed. And one Seems- hit from that thing is going to take any of us yeah, down. Yeah, they've already lost one of their eight arms. So, <laughs> yeah, they've only got a limited supply of those. Nickel seems to me, as a first glance, like this series, Katra. Kind of, yeah. That's not a bad comparison. Oh, yeah, I can see that. I hadn't thought of it, but... They even have similar facial expressions most of the time. Talking about foil characters, which is a storytelling trope Gundam Seed likes a lot, Nickel and Atherin are definitely a foil duo to Tiarka and Izak. Yeah, it seems like Nickel and Atherin should really get along, actually, but... Oh, yeah, there's definitely... Nickel is Atherin's plan B. (laughs) If if things don't work out with Kira. (laughs) And then, you know, they run off. Kira's just firing off the cannon as fast as it'll go. Presumably, the Archangel has some way to recharge it. The four other mobile suits arrive back at the Gamma, which is the other ship, and Izak is pissed and physically attacking Ather and talking about how humiliating it is that they weren't able to get it four on one. Diarca is back in Izak, although he's a lot more casual about it. And Nickel comes in to break up the fight. And to be entirely honest, this isn't they the have place a... you should go to a bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> they've, got a, they've got a point. That you should go to a bedroom? Oh, yeah, no, there's that, definitely that some he, Isaac Atherin stuff going on, a- too. Don't <laughs> Atherin <laughs> disobeyed orders to grab Kira instead of shooting him down? That kind is of. He and Rao did kind of work out. I think Rao would be okay with Atherin's actions, and I think later we find out he absolutely is. But those three weren't in on the talk to him plan, well, yeah. which is kind of a problem since they were on the other ship. Which goes back, uh, you mentioned it a couple times, there isn't really a clear chain of command in Zaft. Orders aren't really relayed, and it's... Well, with this team, it seems to be the pilots, then the captain, then Rao. Yeah. The in-universe But the reasoning... pilots can go, or don't necessarily answer to the captain. He's above them, but they don't necessarily answer to him. I don't know that they it's necessarily like answer to Rao either. Well, the way it works, and this is, again, explained mostly in Destiny and alternate universe stuff, is Zaft was originally a militia, so it's very laissez-faire, and they have teams. So Rao Le Crusade is the commander of the Rao Le Crusade. The, the... Le Crusade team? Yeah. So he's in charge. Then there are the ship captains kind of below him. And then I assume someone's supposed to be in charge of the mobile suit teams. I assume that was Miguel for Atherns, and it's probably Izak for the other ones. But they are two separate mobile suit teams because they are based out of different ships. Well, it's entirely possible that it was Rusty since we never actually saw him. Rusty! Oh, I actually <laughs> found a picture of Rusty. There is one of the endings that has all of the uh, Zaf pilots together. And Rusty is like, that one has to be Rusty because he's no one else. Because there's Miguel and there's Nickel and he's I guess that one has to be Rusty. That's fantastic. But it's entirely possible that he was in charge of the red team since he went down That's in true. episode one. And oh, these yeah, guys I all seem to be Christmas colored. These guys seem to be all on the same level. Yeah, red is a rank in Zaft. It's above the rank and file. Is it above green? Yes. Okay. So again, Nickel defends Ather and he points out that beating up Ather won't fix it now. And Diarka and Izak leave in a huff. Diarka's kind of a D 
dick, but he doesn't Diar- overtly do anything. Diarca and Izak have a very blue oni red oni thing going on they where Izak is right? screaming and yelling, and Diarca is just a casual asshole. Like I noticed that even in just this like thirty second scene. Well, so. this scene I think really is supposed to set up all these characters because Athlon we've seen a lot of. The other three have been around, but we get Izak being a dick all episode, but Diarca doesn't have much to do. I think Nickel the- doesn't have much to do. So I think this scene is really to set up how they all interact. I think really the only time we've seen these pilots has been in episode one, the other three, where they were actually stealing them. Well, in that and episode you don't two, get they comment anything on there. blowing up Heliopolis. Like, Izak's like, serves them all right. Yeah, but and that's Nicole not a was lot obviously to get their personality. That statement, so. There's not a whole lot to get their personality. One line doesn't really set anything up. This isn't their introduction, but this is really where they come into their own. And they're all in the opening, so obviously they're going to be important characters. So Nickel's like, hey, Atherin, you can talk to me. Tell me what's going on. He's like, leave me alone, Nickel. I have to go do Atherangst. (laughs) (laughs) So then we get some (laughs) Atherangst. Then we cut back to the Archangel, where Kira just won't come out of the strike. Moo gets kind of concerned and starts yelling at him and kicking the cockpit. But then when it opens up, he sees Kira is like even more PTSD than the uh, previous scene where Heliopolis destroyed. Is he actually kicking the cockpit? I always thought he was hitting some kind of emergency release. Yeah, it looked like he was opening the latch. There's like a dong, dong, dong sound effect. So it's possible he's going for a release, but it. Okay, (laughs) I always thought that it was the sound effect came from him shifting his position and planting his feet, not actually kicking or trying to get it open. That there was actually an emergency release. Then again, I say that, but now that, why wouldn't Murdoch, the mechanic, have used the emergency release to get him out in the first place? Maybe he's not quick on his feet, Zach. Maybe there's a reason he's a mechanic and not a pilot. Or because pilots have a rank above the mechanical crew. But Kira doesn't. Kira doesn't have a rank. Yeah, technically speaking, Kira doesn't he have a rank. He outranks them all. So this PTSD scene kind of gives another context to both of Kira's beam spamming, and it makes it look a lot more panicked than just awesome. That is true. So even though Kira's super beam spamming out of the explosion was cool and heroic, this gives it an almost sad undertone, which is very Gundam. He was probably panicking at the time. Well, I think you kind of got that to begin with. It was, he was at fight or flight. He was just pulling the trigger as fast as it was going to cycle because he was completely panicked. So again, Mu being a good leader and really an older brother figure here goes real gentle with him. Starts praising him, saying, hey, everyone's alive. You did a good job. Cries his hands off the controls. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, the important thing. Mu is great, and here's one of the reasons. Char is way more of an asshole with his older relationship with Camille, though Camille is kind of a bitch, so. So then we get Flay running at Sai, telling him how scared she was, which really makes sense since she was, like, this morning she was going shopping with her friends, and she was just in a battle all alone. Yep, left with a bunch of random strangers. Artemis, the base that Archangel was going to, agrees to let them in, but they're going to send a officer to inspect them. Which makes sense since, as we learned in the last episode, the Archangel doesn't have an IFF code. I'm really surprised they didn't support the Archangel during that. Like, there were obvious Zaf ships and the ship they were attacking. Well, the enemy of your enemy is your ally. I think they might explain that somewhere in here. They never show them to have any capability of striking beyond their umbrella. I have an explanation in mind, but it's kind of spoilery, so I'll get to it later. That's rare. Also, we'll see they are kind of jerks. (laughs) <laughs> Just a little bit. So, Raul the Crusade gets a telegram, apparently, from the Plant Supreme <laughs> Council. It's like, hey, blowing up Heliopolis, that wasn't cool. Come explain yourself. And he's like, well, I, I have them right here. Okay, well, I guess get Atherin and we'll go. <laughs> we'll leave one of the ships behind. They kind of need repairs anyway. That is true. But they believe the Gamma, which is the other ship, to pursue them. And they get ready to go off. To the homeland. Well, he says as soon as the repairs are done, so that implies they're going to make running repairs, but I guess they also would have to fix them. I never understood why Kira gets into a uniform and signs on, because he never actually is required to. I think he just decided that he's the only person who can really pilot the strike, so he might as well look the I part. wouldn't wear a uniform. My presumption is he does not have any spare clothes. Uh, That's entirely possible. That's fair. He runs into Moo, like, kind of coming out of the dressing station, I guess, and Moo's, like, super older brother chummy with him, like, hey! I actually love this frame that we paused on. It's That's so good. great. It's like, <laughs> Kira looks like he's got this, the stranger danger expression <laughs> on his face. Moo's like, hey, buddy, good pal. Make sure you're the only one who can activate the strike, okay? Which is okay. kind of weird and suspicious, but Moo did say earlier he wasn't sure Artemis would go without a hitch. So this is him being suspicious and kind of 
setting up what's about to happen. So the inspecting officers get on, they're saluting. The Archangel turns around to dock. Artemis turns off its shield, which we see disintegrating rocks ominously, which I guess is also good. It's like, nothing's getting through here. And Sai and Flay look at it, and Sai kind of does some exposition. Hey, this is a cool energy shield. You've seen sci-fi movies, right, Flay? It'll even <laughs> stop beam weapons. And Flay's like, oh, thank God, we'll finally be safe. And Sai is like, maybe. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> now he just says, yeah. So <laughs> well, he's got no reason to be suspicious. These guys are on the same side, right? Except they're part of a different faction of the Earth Alliance. and Yeah, but he's from a different... He, he's from... Uh, Heliopolis. No, um... What is the actual nation? Orb. Called? But Orb. we haven't really learned that yet. But he's from Heliopolis. He has no reason to believe that there'd be any problem here because he has no idea of how the Earth forces work together. So they start locking down the Archangel and they surround it with people in spacesuits with machine guns pointing at it. To be fair, that's completely asinine to point machine guns at a <laughs> battleship. To be f- Just saying, if that thing wants to shoot its way out, a guy with a machine gun is not going to stop it. It makes sense while they're taking defensive precautions, though, because they still have officers aboard the ship. But they so. tried to run this as a cliffhanger, because then the episode ends within the ship. Or Captain Ramius asks what's going on, and the inspector officer is like, I want you to remain silent, which is played up ominous. And I think it's good. They're setting up a cliffhanger, which is good since this episode has ended on such a triumphant note. And like I said, that would be important if this episode aired on a Friday to get people to come back Monday. But I don't know if it's... It's probably the weakest cliffhanger the series has left on so far. That's episode five, Phase Ship Down. I mean, generally, just a great episode. Yeah. Easily the best we've seen so far. You get a lot in 30-second chunks, a lot of characterization, which is kind of surprising. Like, they did it very well. We got a mobile suit battle. We got battleships going to town. We got characterization. What did what did we miss here? Actually, I think... One Mostly I, plot advancement. I think one... Th- That's well, not important. They get to the place they're going. That is true. I think one thing this episode could have done better, though, is we don't really get Kira's friends at all. And they've just signed on to help with the Archangel. So how are they handling live combat? Yeah, them struggling with that, seeing what they're doing, is something they could have added in. They have a lot to do with really making Diarca, Izak, and Nickel into characters. And they kind of struggle. Like, Diarca really doesn't come through as much as the other two. He's much more background and very, very calm as the thing that I've always figured he kind of got portrayed as yeah yeah which is really hard to get it looks like he has no personality because he doesn't really say much so the problem is that is his character is that he's an introvert but so (laughs) again they play him off as a foil to izak and that ends up working because izak is in your face yelling all the time like you said that one 30 second scene it really comes off as red oni blue oni because they take the same side but take different tax approaches exactly and then we also have kira and athern confronting each other they have a lot to say to each other we get atherin's motivation and we get get mu and rao outwitting each other mu gets the one up this time like really a lot like it's a five up even (laughs) so this episode is jam-packed i talked about how the last episode was slow i kind of forgot how all the tension from it is really relieved here and they really work as two episodes they really do i'm actually kind of like a lot of these seem to well i mean we've only what five episodes in yeah Mm -hmm. 10 percent of the way through it seems like we needed a couple two-parters already, and we're only five episodes in. To be fair, Gundam is a real continuous series, though. That is true. I mean, that's one of the things I always liked about anime as a kid, coming from, like, strictly episodic American cartoons, is that episodes are continuous. So. There's a story arc between them all. Exactly. But this is pretty much all one arc, and Gundam did this in three episodes. The original. So they've only added two. That's not too bad. And I'd... they have a lot more characters. And it really doesn't feel like there's padding in this. I have not felt like, man, they really could have cut this entire scene out thus far. Yeah, I haven't gotten that either. All right. Anything else we want to say about this episode other than it's great? Go watch it. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, we got to see a bunch of new mobile suits in action. The duel looks cool. That's actually the one I think we should rank today, if you're up for it. I'm partial to the Buster myself. The Buster is also pretty cool, but the duel's got the the two different lasers. That is the duel, right? Yeah. The greenish one? No, No, that's the Buster. Oh, in that case, never mind. The The Buster is is cool. The duel is the blue one. Oh, okay. blue and gray one that Isaac has. I love the color pattern on that one. Yeah, the Buster is definitely the most original with the two guns and they connect. The, of the five there. Hells, I can't think of the name of it. The black one. The Blitz? The, yeah, the Blitz. It always feels like it should be named something different based on what it the can Epion. do. That we don't know what it does yet. It looks like the Epion to me. So. Uh, yeah, very similar in design. <laughs> I didn't get that. It's visually similar to me. It's not that similar weapon or role wise. All right, but I want to talk about the duel. Like I said, the duel is the most basic of these five Gundams. It's got a blue and gray color scheme. It's got a shield and a beam rifle, two beam sabers, and an underslung grenade launcher. 
It's the most boring of them. And Isaac gets it. <laughs> <laughs> it is about as bog standard as you can get. I mean, it's really highly functional. Like I said, I love the color palette. The actual design of the suit... Eh. It's basically just the Gundam. Yeah. I mean, the Gundam was a great suit. Its role is supposed to be one-on-one -on -one combat with mobile suits, so dueling. And that really fits Isaac's personality, but I don't know that the weapon loadout is super a, good for Like it. a grenade a, launcher? A grenade launcher doesn't really fit with that kind of a payload. You'd want something that's probably close range, like probably a shotgun. Actually, some sort of like grapple where you could like electrify your opponent. Would well, that would make sense. But if you're married to the idea of having it, equipment in a short ranged weapon that would be more useful in a brawl, an underslung shotgun would make more sense than a grenade launcher. A mace? A mace would be fantastic against those shields. It almost feels to me like they wanted five characters because Gundam Wing had five and they didn't have a fifth <laughs> mobile suit idea. So they just kind of threw this one out here, to be honest. Which is weird because Isaac is one of the more explosive characters, so why give him the blindest suit? It might have been a matter of this character will be cool on his own. He doesn't need a cool mobile suit to make him cool. The one you guys like the most, they give to Diarca. Who that is, is true. Also, it is entirely possible they foiled the suits in the pilots because that way they would make them stand out. Because like Jeremy said, we don't get a lot of Diarca here, but we know what the Busters, you got it mixed up with the duel. But yeah, the Buster looks cool. So. That's clearly the one you were thinking of. All right, so let's put it on our list. Do we like the duel more than the strike without a weapon pack? Pretty similar. The duel doesn't have knives, but it gets to use its weapons. Yeah, without the weapon pack, yeah. I'd agree with that. Do we like it more than the sword strike? No. No. Do we like it more than the Mobius Zero? I kind of don't. The Mobius Zero has those cool funnels. I like the Mobius Zero a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm already outvoted here, and I'm not really sure I was leaning towards the duel anyway, so. So duel above the strike and below the Mobius Zero. On our ranking of cool things people pilot in this show. If you want to see our list of all the mobile suits we've ranked thus far, you can see that at www.lastimeonvideogames.com. That's also where you can find our other episodes and our other podcast, Last Time on Video Games, where we play old video games. And very, very rarely, we write something these days. So <laughs> It has happened. Every so often, we've been known to put something else on there. If you'd like to email us, you can do that at Gundam at LastTimeOnVideoGames.com. You can also leave a comment on that fancy website we were talking about. And I hope you'll join us next time when we see Episode 6, The Vanishing Gundam. I wonder what will happen. Maybe Gundam vanishes? Maybe. Bye. damage to engines. We're losing thrust. Enemy mobile armor withdrawing. Shoot it down! Number five sodium wall damaged. It's on fire. Damage control sealing bulkheads. Damn you, move.